It is October 9th, 2023. Raw just went off the air. Uh, not a bad show. I, I pretty much found myself uh, invested throughout the whole night. I mean, I think we knew there was no chance of Cody and Jey Uso losing these championships that quickly. But uh, interesting main event. You know, just um, reminding everyone that uh, Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, not always on the same page. And, you know, they're not going to split anytime soon, but it keeps in the back of your mind, you know, how long will this tag team remain? Uh, at the very end, Kevin Owens holding Jey Uso's arm up in the air and acknowledging him. I don't know how I feel about that. Why? Because he beat you in a match? Losing to Jay does not show trust. Um, yeah, that today was it had listen, Raw was a good show tonight. Definitely had some brain lapses. Uh the one that stuck out for me the most was when Damian Priest came out at the beginning of Raw and attacked Seth Rollins. Yeah, Drew McIntyre walked up the rampway. He left Kofi out, hang out the dry, Xavier Woods, uh, and others. Why did Damian Priest suddenly forget his briefcase? Um, just, I mean, I know Dominic bringing it out and Drew McIntyre stopping him and then throwing the briefcase. I get it. But I think ever since Damian Priest won that briefcase, it's never left his side. And today, you know, for storyline purposes, he didn't have the briefcase. Um, the theme music botch playing Sami Zayn's heel theme, A, hey, nobody's perfect. I mean, yeah, with WWE, you expect everything to be absolutely crisp, no errors, no room for mistakes, but... Yeah, early in the night when Co uh, Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso were in the ring and then were confronted by Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, when Sami Zayn came out, they played his heel theme accidentally. Uh, they fixed it by the end of the night. But uh, listen, let's be honest. Monday Night Raw, we get it every week. We've gotten it since 1993. We like to talk about it a little bit, but obviously... The big talk is 10, 10, 23. I know that doesn't sound the same because for anybody that goes back to the old school TNA, 10, 10, 10. One of the uh, funniest moments in TNA history. Tomorrow's the 13 year anniversary of that, but 10, 10, 23. AEW Dynamite versus NXT. Man, do P, you know, this is a double edged sword. I mean, I get it. Whoever you support the most, it's, listen, if I could compare it to sports just for tonight, 
it's like the Subway Series. Here in New York, it's like the Mets playing the Yankees. You know, there's a lot of New York fans, but some may favor the Mets a little bit more than the Yankees and vice versa. Obviously, hardcore AEW fans that are pro, you know, that that are, um, that they prefer AEW over WWE, uh, they want them to win these ratings tomorrow. Tony Khan is taking this personal, and I think that is a big mistake because, you know, I'm not going to give my ratings prediction yet. I have not written it down. I will do spur in a moment because it seems spur in a moment always seems to be the best way to go. But I think you put out a damn good product. There is n Here is something startling. They don't even have 2,500 tickets sold for AEW Dynamite tomorrow. Not even 2,500 tickets. Yeah, it shows about 2,500 seats filled, but that also includes a lot of comps that were given out locally. Um, there is about 2,500. That's what you got to concern yourself about. You know, just get this starts to get into the WCW category where Eric Bischoff was more obsessed about winning the ratings. And yes, for 83 weeks he did. But when problems and holes started to, to creep, you know, you just basically ignored it. The holes got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then it got to the point of no return. You know, this Wednesday, on Wednesday Night Dynamite, we're going to have an honest conversation about Adam Copeland. And listen, I am a big fan of Adam Copeland. I am not, you know, exiting the bus. Uh, I love the fact that he is still wrestling. And it will be cool at times to see him do some stuff in AEW. But in the year 2023... Is Adam Copeland a ratings drawer, an attendance drawer, an audience drawer? You know, for a lot of us that experienced his entire career, you know, it's it doesn't feel the same. But let's be honest, when he was in WWE the last couple of years, when he first returned, I think the turning point was the greatest match of all time or whatever that shit was with Randy Orton. You know, it felt like, okay, you know, all right. After that, the, the Hell in a Cell with Finn Balor was amazing. You know, the, the, that was just tremendous, his, his match with Finn Balor. It has moments, but on a weekly basis. Am I going to drop what I'm doing to see what is he going to say on Dynamite? He's Why does it take three shows to answer Christian Cage? It feels that you're more about announcements and hype than the actual storyline. And I know that there's people that are real diehard for AEW that think their storylines are solid and, you know, they're, they're okay. But they're not, let me drop what I'm doing and watch. And I can't, I don't even want to wait for the replay. I don't even want to wait for YouTube. I don't even want to wait for Hulu or streaming media. I want to see what goes down tonight. You see that with the bloodline. And yes, you know, yeah, they're obviously bigger stars, more polished, but still, when storylines are very shaky, with all due respect, I don't give a flying fuck that Adam Copeland is fighting Luchasaurus. For AEW fans, they may be into it. You got to start building new fans, man. Because if you peaked, you're going to slowly start having some fans are like, hey, I'm still an AEW fan, but I'm not as hardcore as I used to be. You have to replace some of those fans with other fans. you got to build and build and build. And that Cracker Jack surprise, let me tell you something. There's a lot of people on social media, a lot of the people who pandered, journalists, podcasters for four years that thought that you know they were caressing the egos of AEW management. And the problem is, you know, with some of these soft egos, they bought into it. And they're catering for that, you know, that that group. And unfortunately, that is not the majority. And now you basically, that's why if you notice, uh, people were shocked at Dave Meltzer saying, man, AEW is cold right now. 
How is it cold? How is it cold? You just had fucking Wembley. Everybody just said a month. Wembley was one month ago and one month ago coming off of Wembley, coming off of All Out, coming off of uh, Wrestle Dream. It, we're on a roll with this. How is it cold? People are starting to realize it's backfiring. So we'll talk about that more on Wednesday. But today, obviously, the big hype is Tuesday night. AEW Dynamite versus NXT. And we'll preview both shows. And, you know, once again, cheap plug for anybody that is interested. Tomorrow night, I'm going to try to do the impossible. We're going to do a watch party for both shows at the same time. We will have it picture in picture. And we will see. And, you know, WWE announced earlier today that NXT, the first 30 minutes, was going to be commercial free. So because of that... AEW got from Warner Media that their first 30 minutes is commercial free. Tony Khan securing a 10 minute overrun. Man, you know, if you got good shit, you know, the, the, when I first started podcasting, doing hotlines, I used to rip everybody. I used to make fun of every podcast, every hotline host, every, I just, and it was funny at times. We did skits, we did, you know, a lot of mocking, making fun of it. It was funny. After a while, it got old. And I'll never forget somebody who I really, really trust, you know, in wrestling that I became friends with over the years told me way back when and said, DT, tell people to tune into you, not because everybody else is bad, but because your shit is good. And that's something that to this day I stick to. You know, I want people to tune in, not because someone else sucks, but because I'm good. And with AEW, if your shit is good, the fans are not going to flock away during a commercial break and I'm going to tune into NXT and I'm going to forget to tune back. Whether there's a commercial on or not, if someone's going to change the channel, they are. So, you know, tit for tat, tat for tit, tit for tit. You know, it's like, just put on good shit, man. Um, but, you know, we'll see what happens. But tomorrow we're going to do a little watch party. I want to give a shout out to the NH nerd. He won the Dominic Mysterio sign card from Friday. Uh, I don't choose the winners anymore. I let the company that uh, runs everything, they choose it at random this way. You know, uh, no one accuses me of bias, so... NH Nerd, just reach out to me. I'll hook you up with that Dominic Mysterio card. But, uh, you know, tomorrow's going to be pretty damn good. And, uh, yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, tonight on Raw, I got to be honest with you, my favorite part, which came off a little weird, to be honest with you, was the Ludwig Kaiser video, the A-plus specimen yeah, every time I hear A+, plus, I always hear A-plus player. The A-plus player, A-plus specimen. Where is this going? This is like Giovanni Vinci without the car. I mean, listen, Ludwig Kaiser, if you remember my show two or three weeks ago, remember when I said he was standing next to Gunther and Kaiser it actually looks almost taller than Gunther? He's got that physical presence about him. Louis Kaiser, it, 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 he is a, a specimen, a, a, the A-plus specimen. <laughs> um, that was just an interesting piece. It almost makes you feel like, you know what it feels like? It feels like he was off TV for three months, and they decided to repackage him, and this is a vignette for his return. That's what it certainly felt like. I'm not crapping on it. I liked it, but at the same time, it just felt weird. It just felt random. It just felt out of place. Plus, if I'm Giovanni Vinci right now, I'm like, where's my vignette? Can we replay when I used to drive in a Ferrari? So Vinci, you know, he's still in, in Imperium, and so is Kaiser, but this certainly made you feel like Kaiser is going to be breaking out soon. I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, Kaiser is tremendous, but... 
you know, Kaiser's not going to be the the next Jey Uso. And what I mean by that is someone coming from a tag team and breaking out as a big superstar on their own. Kaiser, I definitely would love to see him as a single star in the future, but not now. Not now. I just feel that'll get lost in the shuffle. Maybe they're doing this down the line to get a match with Gunther and Kaiser. If you remember early on when they were on the main roster, when uh, Kaiser was screwing up a little bit, Gunther chopped him. And Gunther was berating Kaiser. I mean, I know Gunther's re read both guys the riot act recently in storyline, but it got physical last year. And we thought at that time that, up oh, Kaiser's getting tossed. So maybe they're leading to that match. By the way, I want to shout out, and I, I guess we can mention it now. I saw this come in as we started the show. Thank you, Sal, for the 10 spot, my friend. He says, DT props for calling Bronson Reed last week as Gunther's next opponent for the title. Do I think Bronson Reed could shock the world and win the U.S. title next week? Um, yeah, last week we were talking about Bronson Reed. I mean... It's not hard to figure it out. We could have even used it as sausage. But Bronson Reed, WWE's going to be an elimination chamber in Australia. Bronson Reed will have an important role in Australia for that match. Last week, we were talking about Bronson Reed trying to figure out why did they speed up Ciampa as Gunther's opponent? Why didn't they do the title defense today? Why did they just decide, you know what, let's get it out of the way and move on? And then we were... Thinking, okay, who's next for Gunther? And the only person that kept coming to mind was Bronson Reed. Bronson Reed won a three-way match today, beating Ricochet and Chad Gable. And Bronson Reed now gets the opportunity to have a match with Gunther next week. And this is not to make Gunther, uh, you know, a little bit of a fan favorite. I mean, he's a fan favorite in a lot of people's eyes already because of the respect factor, the just how he carries himself, the quality of his matches. There's a, and plus, if you follow Gunther's personal life, you can't help but like the guy. Bronson Reed's not a bad cat. Bronson Reed's a good guy. I mean, there's nothing controversial about him outside of wrestling. You know, so you root for Bronson Reed as well. Next week is about Battle of the Titans, two giants going at it. And in the end, to answer Sal, no, Bronson Reed is not going to shock the world next week. Bronson Reed will put up a performance against Gunther, and Bronson Reed will be elevated that much more, little by little, leading into Elimination Chamber. Unfortunately, some people are still in denial, but some people think that Chad Gable is still on the quest of becoming intercontinental champion at this point. Uh, if you still believe that, then WWE is doing a great job right now. But unfortunately, uh, there's only one person who is in a hunt right now for the intercontinental championship, and that is Gunther. And guess what? He already has the title. There is nobody right now where you feel, okay, Getting the win over Gunther is going to elevate them to the next level. I know people want that orgasmic moment, surprise, you know, gushing with emotion, but then you got to think about the morning after. And I know I repeat myself all the time, but you think about Sami Zayn and Chamber. You think about Zelina Vega in Puerto Rico. You think about Mustafa Ali in Saudi Arabia. You know, you get these people, with, you know, to get 3,000 likes, like, you know, how amazing of a moment. You know, give her her flowers. Give this person this. How amazing. Sami Zayn has earned it. Give it. He should be. And then he, people, oh, I, I need that. And then the next day, you'd be like, what the fuck did they did do that for? Now what? Chad Gable beating Gunther in a beat the clock and by a count out. It was the best thing for Chad Gable because a month later we forgot about that because Gunther still has the championship. So Chad has a little bit of elevation, but right now he is not on the path of the IC title. Not now. Maybe a year from now. Maybe six months from now. Maybe it'll be a WrestleMania moment. But right now the perception is they're trying to keep people in the hunt so it doesn't feel like what Asuka started to become when she came to the main roster. She had an amazing run in NXT. 
came to the main roster. And then she faced Charlotte at WrestleMania. And even with that, a lot of people were like, man, nobody is on anywhere near the level of Asuka. And then what happened? They had Asuka feud with Carmella. And nothing against Carmella. But it's like, okay. Remember, remember when we call, talked about I don't want to say called it about When we talked about it at that time? When Asuka started feuding with Carmella, everybody and their mother is like, this is ridiculous. Like, Oscar's all the way up here and Carmella's all the way down here. What did they do? They did dumb antics with James Ellsworth coming out with an Oscar mask in the cage and all this other stuff. And Carmella beat Oscar a bunch of times. And people were like, what the fuck are they doing with Oscar? They're ruining her career. There's a no, the problem is they built her so damn high that you couldn't have her lose without feeling that her momentum is destroyed. That's kind of the problem they ran into with Jay Cargill. Somebody there thought that her having this uh, tremendous winning streak and undefeated streak with the championship, I don't care which belt it is in AEW. I don't care if it's the highest belt or the lowest belt. You know, it, it just put her on a level where the only way she would look dominant many times was beating enhancement talent. And that's not Jay Cargill's fault. That's because they trained her just to the point where she could do enough in the ring to look dominant, win the matches, and let's just, you know, two minutes and out of there, you know. And they ran into a lot of roadblocks towards the end, and, and that's why Jay Cargill pick, picked up and left because she was not going to create. Listen, even if Jay Cargill would have remained in AEW, you look at Tiffany Stratton over the past 12 months, you look at Lola Vice over the past four months. You got Jay Cargill there for a couple of years. And right now, if you put her on WWE television and you put her in a 10, 15 minute match with a Rhea Ripley or an Oscar or an EO Sky or a Bailey or Charlotte Flair, you know, she'll have moments in the match where she'll be decent, but she'll be a deer in headlights. And think of how many years she was there and still is nowhere near ready to, it's like riding a bike after a while. It's got to be second nature. You see a lot of women, and listen, unfortunately, Dana Brooke was an example. A couple other women in NXT right now that are still learning their craft is an example. But you see it happen a lot in AEW. I don't like the botch Twitter accounts. I chuckle sometimes at some of the video, but I don't like mocking and making fun of people who are really trying to, you know, improve. But you can't help but to look at some of the women in AEW, like when they have a match, they literally have to stop and like run the opposite side of the road to like build up momentum before they can do a spot. It's like there has to be a certain cadence before they could do something and it looks so bad and so unnatural that you have to think and set yourself up and build yourself up and wind yourself up. It's got to become second nature. You got to become second nature. So, you know, but uh, Bronson Reed, I don't know how we went from Bronson Reed to Jay Cargill, but no, Bronson Reed will put on a battle next week. Fans will respect him a little bit more from hanging with Gunther, but this is to continue the rise of Bronson Reed. And we will see what match he gets at Elimination Chamber when they're in Australia. That will be a high-profile match. Now, something else that happened on, on Raw tonight. And listen, if you tuned in to last week's predictions for Fastlane, for Kevin and I, if you tuned in to even last night's recap and review of Fastlane, um, there is one person that we focused on more than anything. And that person was Drew McIntyre. And even last night, after Seth Rollins retained the World Heavyweight Championship against Nakamura, I was blown away by how few people talked about Drew McIntyre. Uh, I was blown away at how many people thought that Nakamura had to win the championship. Otherwise, he's back in mediocrity. Shinsuke Nakamura was never meant to be elevated to main event status. Shinsuke Nakamura 
is a bona fide main eventer. But on the WWE roster, nah, he's really not. You needed two months of a big, major storyline to develop to get him to that level. But as we said last Tuesday on the predictions, and I says, as I said yesterday, soon as the match was over with, which, with uh, Seth Rollins, he was going to go right back and feud with Ricochet. And that's exactly what happened tonight. Ricochet, and it was funny. This was another thing. Ricochet got attacked by Shinsuke Nakamura. He got hit with a Kinshasa right before the three-way match. Ricochet loses, eats a tsunami from Bronson Reed, and Bronson Reed gets the win. Later on, uh, Ricochet's pissed off at Adam Pearce for Nakamura, you know, interfering at the beginning and causing him this. And I was like, wait a minute. At the beginning of the night, Shinsuke Nakamura was getting interviewed and Ricochet attacked him. So not for nothing, Ricochet, you deserved to get your ass handed to you from Nakamura later on in the night. But next week, they could have a false count anywhere match. And that shit's going to be off the hook. I'm a little surprised that they're not having a match at Saudi Arabia. Maybe they do. Maybe the Saudi Arabia will be the finale between those two guys. But, um, yeah, Nakamura did hit him with the GTS. Oh, you know what? Let's just get it out of the way now. Speaking of GTS, CM Punk, I got to show you something. And I got to play something. I promise you, when I play this, you'll appreciate it. We got this week in wrestling history that we do every week. And I last month or so, I've been pulling some audio clips, and everybody loves it. Some people are like, don't give us the controversial Tammy Sit shit anymore and, you know, Melanie Pillman with Vince. Yeah, I know. That was really uncomfortable, cringeworthy. From now on, we're going to have more fun, positive stuff. But this week in history... CM Punk had a segment on Raw that no one ever talks about anymore. And I listened to the audio and I'm like, my God, this audio could be today. And nobody would dispute it. If you remember the walkout, remember Triple H was being accused of unsafe working conditions? Everybody walked out except for a few. CM Punk was there, and CM Punk ended up doing play-by-play -play commentary on Raw that night. A lot of people forget that CM Punk cut a little promo before Triple H put him in the announcer's booth. I just want, you, you'll appreciate this. I want you to just listen to about two minutes of audio. And as you listen to CM Punk, tell me this doesn't fucking sound like AEW and WWE in 2023. I can't help but feel a little bit respond. Well, hell, who am I kidding? I feel like I started this whole thing. This is all my fault. I've been at the epicenter of anything controversial ever since you took over. Actually, since before that, I'm sure you remember, John Boy. I was there. You were there. I'm the guy that made walking out look cool. The, the thing about it is I think everybody in the parking lot having a picnic right now completely misunderstood what I was trying to do. See, I didn't break my contract. I didn't break my word. My contract expired, and I was trying to prove a point to an entire company, not just one man. If anybody has any reason to walk out of the WWE, well, you can probably put me at the top of that list. I mean, my microphone constantly cuts out. Your friend, Kevin Nash, runs through the, well, slowly, briskly, runs through the crowd and jumps me and screws me, not once, but twice. Somebody here doesn't want me to be the WWE champion. The thing about it is this entire industry is based on men solving their problems in between these ropes. This is the company that gives you hell in a cell. This is the company that gives you the elimination chamber. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but unsafe working environment? I thrive on that. Hell, this is professional wrestling. This ain't ballet.
If you believe in something, you stand and you fight, and you fight on the front line. You don't have a hippie sit-in and grill tofu dogs in the parking lot like a bunch of hippies. When I had a problem with you and your authority, I dealt with you personally. And you, you big boy scout, when I had a problem with you being the poster boy for this company, I dealt with you personally. Shamo, I'm sure sooner or later you're gonna step on my toes. I'll deal with you personally. Now I know you three smiley good guys look across the ring from me and I'm the last guy you expect to see here and, and I know I'm the last guy you expect to see in the foxhole with you, but you know what? Here I am. All right, we'll leave it at there. You tune into the, the history show, you could hear the rest of it. So, Funny commentary, by the way, as well. Tell me that wouldn't apply for 2023. Almost all of that. Seriously, almost all of that. I, I was listening to it back, and I was like, wow, that really, really could apply to 2023. But uh, CM Punk posted a little bit of a cryptic cartoon on Instagram. And you be the judge if this is directed towards Seth Rollins. Now, remember, this was posted right after SmackDown, right after they were showing the preview for Shinsuke versus Seth Rollins and Corey Graves was talking about the devil and using the quote that CM Punk did in Ring of Honor. And CM Punk posted this cartoon. I think this is supposed to be Iron Man or whatever. I don't follow comics all that much, but it basically, it, it's, you know, it says, so from that moment, our truce will extend for 24 hours during which neither of us will launch any aggression against the other, either personally or indirectly. Agreed? And then uh, the other, the, the, I guess the robot says, the terms are acceptable. If not satisfied, if not satisfactory, let us proceed. So a lot of people, oh, thank you very much, Michael. It's Iron Man and Dr. Doom. So I think CM Punk, is he Iron Man and is Seth Rollins Dr. Doom or is it vice versa? But uh, you be the judge. Is that a little bit of a cryptic message that, hey, let's put our personal shit aside. Let's make money. Let's make history. I truly believe Seth, uh, Seth Rollins versus CM Punk is an absolute guarantee I think the only way CM Punk does not return to WWE is if when he has, you know, the meeting that was supposed to go down, remember Florida with Jericho and supposed to be CM Punk and the Young Bucks and Tony Khan and a bunch of people had their lawyers tell others, no, nah, we don't want to talk to you. You know, it's just, if you, if you, I've said it many times over, you know, that is probably one of the reasons why, per personally, I don't like the Young Bucks and I don't like Hangman Page and I don't like CM Punk to a certain extent. But you're working for a new company that's been around for four years that has the opportunity to grow to an even bigger level and you're the focal point in a lot of ways. And for the betterment of the company, to make an example to the rest of the locker room and to your boss that, you know what, you know, we may not like each other, but we all work for Tony Khan. We all work for AEW. We work for the fans. We have to show this locker room that, you know what, you know, people don't have to break bread with each other. But when they work under the banner AEW, we all have a common goal. And a fucking bunch of babies were like, no, my lawyer, my lawyer told you to stay the fuck away from us. You know, it just, no. No excuse for that. No excuse for that. If CM Punk would have slapped one of their mothers, you know, run over their pet and run over it again, you know, you do something, sleep with their significant other, okay, that's different. But, you know, because, oh, God. Sticks and stones may break my bones but names will never hurt me so we'll see what happens i think that was a little cryptic message playing into the seth rollins hype uh we'll see by the way uh i don't know if you all saw the media scrum but 
I watched the whole thing today, and I can't play, obviously, a lot of parts of it, but somebody, I don't know who to credit because it's all over Twitter, but somebody chopped up the Cody Rhodes Jey Uso media scrum into like a minute and a half. And when you, I'm going to play it right now. And for anyone out there, if you haven't watched this, or even if you did, I know you're going to love it, it again. But you understand this is not a Booker T. Goldust situation like we talked about yesterday. But I promise you, no one in WWE ever envisioned this comedic dynamic between Jey Uso and Cody Rhodes. Uh, friends, yes. But on this level where you just feel like you don't want them to break up as a tag team for years, this is just the sample of what went down on a media scrum Saturday night. Y'all know Kasama. Kasama been here older. She older than all of us. Like she, she, she been here since both our daddies was here. <laughs> but full disclosure. Yeah. Ood and I might have had a libation or two on the bus. Hi, Jay. Hi, Cody. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> um, yeah. I hope you don't hate me for bringing this up. I, I wish you had asked an easier question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Ask Jay. Jay, where are we at in the story? Uh. <laughs> uh. Sorry, honey. Like we all... We all hustle hard. Everybody's in their hustles. I bet a bunch of y'all lost lost money thinking Judgment Day was going to win tonight, though. Let's go. You feel me? You feel me? Come on. Appreciate him, though, man. But, man, come on. <clears throat> my man. That's my man. Um, I, I, I'm uh, the question. We veered away from it. What was the question? You feel me? You feel me? For real. Do you feel him, sir? Do 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 your twenty year old so Donnie Burgess Network Indiana. Um, oh, you local? Yes, sir. A local. So you brought up the nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> you brought up the nightmare. Are you local? Was that insane in the membrane? Insane in the brain. Oh man. Um. Yeah, that could have went on and on and on. There's just a really, really fun dynamic there. And, uh, you know, one thing that annoyed me about Raw tonight, I'm telling you, 99% of you out there will agree with me on this. When Michael Cole went in the ring with Jey Uso and Cody Rhodes, and Michael Cole started asking Cody Rhodes about finishing the story, and then even saying, without necessarily saying Roman Reigns' name, but saying that maybe you don't want to step back in the ring, you know, for you know for that opportunity again because maybe you will fail. And then bringing up Dusty Rhodes, which we just had that conversation last night, that maybe he doesn't want another shot at the WWE Championship because he failed the first time around. And what's going on? with the story we all watch the documentary and there's that awkward pause and cody's just silent and you could feel that audience wants to hear cody talk about he still wants he's going for roman reigns you knew somebody's fucking music was gonna hit not only did music hit but it ended up being Sami Zayn's old theme accidentally but you knew there was no way that Cody Rhodes was going to comment about it tonight. Now the question is, is that the announcement on NXT? I think it has to be. I hope we don't get any bullshit where somebody shows up at NXT and interrupts Cody so he doesn't make the announcement again. Sooner or later, that announcement's coming. Please don't milk that for three weeks. Please don't milk that for three weeks. I think Cody Rhodes will announce that ultimately, however he can get the path, but he is going back for Roman Reigns' championship. But when they did that segment in the ring today, you knew 
This was, you know what this reminded me of three weeks ago? Remember? So, let's talk about Jey Uso. And before he could say anything, the Judgment Day, run Monday Night Raw. And then the following week. So, last week I was rudely interrupted. Let's talk about Jey Uso. And then Dominic Mysterio comes out. And inter that three weeks it took for Cody to say just why he brought him back. And I don't, I hope they're not doing that again with this. Hopefully tomorrow they just make the announcement. I'm going, I'm gunning for Roman Reigns. Roman, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm coming for you, you know, and then you start the slow burn leading into Survivor Series, leading into, you know, the Royal Rumble in January. And then you go to the road to WrestleMania. So, but I don't think anybody and their mother thought that Cody was actually going to say something tonight. And he didn't. He didn't. All right. Um, you know, I wish Dusty Rhodes was still around. Seriously. I, I think it would have been so much fun. Plus, it would have been interesting to see how Dusty Rhodes would have been incorporated in this story. I, I'll tell you this much. I know this may sound a little bit strange, but if Dusty Rhodes was still with us, I think Cody would have finished the story at WrestleMania 39. I just can't picture even like continuing that story for another 12 months when you have Dusty in the background because you know everybody would be like, hey, Cody, like father, like son. Like father, like son. You know, and then Dusty can't comment about it. You know, you or you pick up yourself and you keep going at it, you keep fighting. But I think they probably would have had to finish that story at WrestleMania 39. But yeah, Cody always getting interrupted. Always getting interrupted. But I really enjoyed that media scrum. Jey Uso, I don't know if he, uh, you know, had a little babanya or if he had a couple of cocktails, but he was lit. Jey Uso was lit. But, hey, it's not against the law. You know, he was having a good time, and their match was early in the night, so, you know, they were just chilling in the back. And uh, there's a weird, funny dynamic going on over there. And, uh, listen, Jey Uso is one of the biggest baby faces in his company now. You know, and I tell you, as ridiculous as we thought it was, I, I'll be the first to admit it, as ridiculous as we thought it was six weeks ago or eight weeks ago that Jimmy versus Jey Uso at WrestleMania, because we were like, it's so far away. Like, how, I mean, that's their dream match, to face each other at WrestleMania. Now I think it's a lock. Jey Uso versus Jimmy Uso at WrestleMania 40 is got to be a lock. And we're already in October. So, you know, in less than 90 days, we're pretty much hyping up the Royal Rumble. So, yeah, I think that is absolutely going to be happening. But let's focus on Raw a little bit and talk about a couple of things because we did have a match announced for Crown Jewel. And we may be leading to another match at Crown Jewel. Might be a fatal four-way. I don't know if you picked up on it tonight and then we'll talk a little bit about tomorrow night's AEW NXT we got ratings too very interesting ratings this week I will tell you this if you follow my ratings breakdown week in and week after uh, for the for last couple of months there are four people that we have brought up and we have gone out of, out of, out of our way to point out that their ratings are are at the bottom of every show that they're on. This week it happened again. And I'm not even going to be suspenseful, suspenseful about it. Rey Mysterio Jr., Rey Mysterio, the acclaimed, and Billy Gunn. Once again, rock bottom. I mean, not dismal numbers, but once again, the acclaimed, and Billy Gunn, and Rey Mysterio are at the lowest parts of their TV shows. The acclaimed are on a streak. I think it's like five straight weeks that the acclaimed have been the lowest on whatever show that they're on. And Rey Mysterio, it's got to be, I think the the match, actually the match with Santos Escobar, the match he had with Santos two weeks ago, it, the, the, the first half was the lowest quarter of the night. The second half was the highest quarter of the night. But Rey Mysterio just repeatedly, I don't know what that means. Does just, just Is it just that, 
you know, he's a legend. He could still go. He's beloved, and we all like him. But because we've seen so much of him, it's like, uh, you know, you miss a Ray match, you're not going to miss. The, it's not the end of the world. I could watch it on YouTube later. But the acclaim to Billy Gunn, there's no excuse for that. There's also another tag team that two weeks in a row are at the bottom as well. And it's going to surprise you what two people it, uh, it is going to be. But let's let's briefly run down Monday Night Raw tonight. And opened up with Seth Rollins. And, and I'll say this too. This is another thing that annoyed me about Raw tonight. You know, I didn't like Damian Priest coming out without the briefcase. Sami Zayn music, blip, not a big deal. But Seth Rollins, 48 hours ago, had a brutal Falls Count Anywhere match with Shinsuke Nakamura, beat him. Seth beat him too. Seth beat the crap out of Shinsuke as well. But we're not even 48 hours later, and Seth comes out. <laughs> not a scratch, not a bandage, not a bruise, not a limp, nothing. Came out there like he didn't even have a match 48 hours ago. I mean, I know his promo. I heard, I, I, I heard his promo. But the visual matters too, you know? And there was nothing. There was absolutely nothing. And then Seth Rollins kind of teasing that, you know, maybe this broke him and it might be time to, like, step back a little bit and this and that. And there was that awkward pause where everybody thought, is he making an announcement, an abrupt announcement? And Seth's like, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> and then you realize it's a troll job. But, again, Seth not selling any bumps, bruises, injuries, cuts, nothing, nothing from Saturday. So then Drew McIntyre's music hits. And I loved it because if you see the thumbnail for today's show, I put that thumbnail up this afternoon. It was to follow up what we talked about for a couple of weeks now. Drew McIntyre may be the one to dethrone Seth Rollins of the World Heavyweight Championship. It might not be the first match between the two, but their second time around, I think Drew, as of right now, I'm pretty confident Drew McIntyre is going to become your next world heavyweight champion, and it's going to happen sooner than later. So Drew McIntyre's music hits. Drew comes out there, and Drew wants to challenge Seth Rollins for the world heavyweight championship at Crown Jewel. And Seth Rollins accepts. And, you know, Seth is kind of like playing into what Drew's behavior has been for the last couple of weeks. It would come into play a little bit later. And Drew's like, no, you know, I'm not going to attack you. I'm not going to do this. I just want to match. You know, I I'm, I say what I mean. I mean what I say. And uh, they have the match. But then Seth's like, you don't have to leave. You used to be in a band. You could sing a little bit. You know, the party's just starting. And Drew's like, no, 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 I got things to take care of in the back, but if anybody sees me in a pub somewhere, buy me a pint, buy me a shot. And Drew leaves. You know, fans still take him as a baby face. So as Drew's going up the rampway, here's Damian Priest. Suddenly he forgets his freaking briefcase. He starts wailing on Seth Rollins, leaves him laying, and Drew is looking at Seth, and the fans are like, save him, help him, help him. And Drew McIntyre doesn't do anything. But Damian Priest is signaling for somebody to come out, I guess, with his briefcase. He forgot to take it with him. So here comes Dominic Mysterio, Jada McDonough. And before Dominic could walk down the rampway, Drew McIntyre stops him. And Dominic's like, what are you doing? I'm just trying to help my friend. And Drew headbutts him, knocks him on his ass, picks up the briefcase and throws it and almost hits the back screen. I mean, flung that son of a bitch. And uh, Damian Priest is all pissed off. I mean, I guess you have to physically hand the briefcase to the referee, you know, but he couldn't cash in as a result because Drew took the briefcase and flung it. So Damian Priest is pissed off. 
Damian Priest, we go to commercial later on. We come back. Damian Priest has got Jaden McDonough by the throat. And that was kind of crappy too because we find out that Jaden McDonough needs to prove himself a little bit. This motherfucker in storyline just cost him the undisputed WWE Tag Team Championships. There's How is there any room for proving yourself? To me, I don't like that storyline. But Jaden McDonough has an opportunity to prove himself. He's going to take on Drew McIntyre tonight. Well, Jaden McDonough lost in three minutes. Drew beat the fuck out of him. And where does that leave J.D. McDonough with Judgment Day? A lot of people are starting to think more and more that ultimately Damian Priest will be out of Judgment Day and it'll be Dominic Mysterio, J.D. McDonough, Rhea Ripley, and Finn Balor. Finn Balor, you know, not physically involved. Today was pretty much focused on Damian Priest. Damian Priest, I think for some people's relief, no injuries. There was a lot of concern even though we talked about it yesterday that he was okay, but there was a lot of concern uh, at Fastlane and he might have legitimately hurt his leg. He sold it beautifully. Everything he did sold it perfectly. And I don't want to see Damian Priest cash in right now. I don't think it's the right time. I really believe that Drew McIntyre is next in line because if Drew McIntyre turns full-blown heel on Seth Rollins... He will be over as a massive heel. The only thing is, if Drew McIntyre becomes world heavyweight champion, what next? Who does he feud with? You know, you got a few people in mind, but, you know, you got to think about a little bit further down the line. But ultimately, Drew McIntyre beats the balls out of J.D. McDonough tonight. Uh, Rhea Ripley, you know, once again, that interesting dynamic with the fans... You know, they're cheering for one minute, and they're booing her the next. Because one of the matches that we had tonight was Nia Jax taking on Raquel Rodriguez. Match was good while it lasted, but Nia Jax won. She won by disqualification because Rhea Ripley came out and attacked Nia Jax. Referee calls for the bell. Rhea's trying to get a little offense in on Nia Jax. Raquel Rodriguez is a little annoyed for Rhea getting involved in the match, causing the match to end. And then here comes Shayna Baszler. Shayna Baszler ends up suplexing Rhea Ripley. And crowd was chanting for Rhea Ripley during most of this. And I think maybe... WWE expected more of a babyface pop towards Shayna Baszler. She got some, but, you know, the fans are still, you know, they really want to cheer the shit out of Rhea Ripley. You could feel it, but she's still Judgment Day, still a heel, still mommy for Dom Dom. So later on in the night, Rhea Ripley is pissed off, and Rhea Ripley goes to Adam Pearce, Adam Pierce, there was a segment where Adam Pierce was talking to Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell, and they were concerned because DIY, Johnny Gargano, Tommaso Ciampa. We played that little clip that Johnny Gargano put on social media earlier today, but they did an interview segment earlier in the day. Wade Barrett was interviewing both of them, and they were talking about seven years in the making of DIY being on the main roster, and you know they ultimately want to win tag team championships, and they are immediately uh, attacked by Imperium. Ludwig Kaiser, Giovanni Vinci, they leave them laying. Good segment. Great camera work. You know, they beat the balls out of both of them, so later on, you got Adam Pierce with Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell because they're concerned. You know, how's Johnny Gargano? How's my husband? How's Tommaso? No Dexter Loomis, though. What's going on with Dexter? And uh, nobody brings that up. You know what was interesting? I got to say this now, just, just to mention it. I'm sure in the last 12 hours, you've seen people suddenly fawn once again about Triple H. This is not a shit on Triple H moment, but I have to mention it anyway. I'm sure you have seen reports that it appears that Triple H is 99% leading creative now, that Vince is really not in that role. And people were bringing up examples. Oh, Zia Lee. 
back on TV today. Little stare down with Becky Lynch. Oh, Cameron Grimes. Cameron Grimes back on SmackDown. Assisted Dragon Lee. Oh, DIY. Johnny Gargano back on TV. Oh, Bronson Reed getting a little bit of a push. Oh, and they're, they're using all these examples like, you see, Triple H, he really is a child. And again, this is not a crap on on Triple H. Everybody I just mentioned, you tell me how they're going to fucking pop a rating, boost anything. Like, just because they're back on TV, oh, that means, um, are we supposed to forget everything that was done with Dexter Loomis? This just felt like a clogged toilet. And Dexter Loomis was, at some points, my favorite wrestler in NXT. Are we supposed to forget how awful some of these people were used on television? Are we blaming that on Vince McMahon now? Like, suddenly, because everybody's back on TV, that they're fawning, like, this is the greatest thing. Triple H is in full power. Like, suddenly, these are going to be... the I, I, you, there, All the people online, I paid to see Candice LeRae. I paid to see Zia Lee. I paid to see Cameron Grimes. Look, look, I'm a woman, and I'm still growing my chest just like Cameron. Cameron Grimes to the moon. They're going to be enhancement talent. You think Zia Lee's going to be Becky Lynch? Did Cameron Grimes is suddenly going to get a tag team title shot? That Candice LeRae is going to suddenly stop being be, beating Rip, Rhea Ripley? That Indy Hartwell is going to start overtaking Nia Jax? They're all going to get squashed. They're back on TV. Triple H is back at Cran... What the fuck is wrong with these people? I just go around and look at what was written today. I'm, I'm reading, and they're putting all these examples like, look at this person, look at this person, look at this person. I'm like, yeah, uh, maybe they're on TV because... Dolph Ziggler just got released and Matt Riddle just got released and 15 other people got released and we need to put some people on TV that day. I mean, are these people that stupid? I don't get it. It's just that I need that orgasmic, emotional, everything is good in the wrestling world moment. By the way, oh, I could say this. I could say this. Uh, I got contacted by Matt Riddle through a source. And uh, he is going to break his silence. I'm not putting this in the headlines. This is just from telling me to you. He's going to be breaking his silence soon. He's pretty tired of a lot of the misinformation online, a lot of the bullshit. He's going to be doing a few select interviews, and he would like to know if I want to interview him. So I told, I talked to Misha today and I told her, I don't know because he's going to do, he's going to break his silence. You break your silence with TMZ. You break your silence with Ariel Hawani. You don't break your silence with Don Tony. You know what I mean? So you let him do his big interviews and then I'll probably do a little discussion with him. So I just figured I'd let you know that. You know, he specifically told her, you know, and he told me that if I want to interview him, he's cool with it. So we'll see what happens. We'll see. Maybe we'll have a, that'll be the next forbidden door. So anyway, later in the night, after Damian Priest attacked Seth Rollins and couldn't cash in, Seth Rollins sees Drew McIntyre in the back. Suddenly, Seth Rollins has his balls in a bunch because Drew McIntyre didn't save him. How spectacular of a world heavyweight champion that he was getting attacked in the ring and Drew should have saved him. But Drew instead watched and walked up the rampway and did nothing. And Drew's like, look, I, I don't, I'm not getting involved in other people's business anymore. So it's supposed to lead to the additional tension like Drew is doing he's selfish that's the storyline right now you got a you got a bunch of people that think that jay uso cannot be trusted and drew mcintyre is selfish you got some very fragile wrestlers right now but that's where this is leading so that's what we're going to get a little bit later on uh a match that i really enjoyed 
But as much as I'm enjoying Ivar doing what he's doing, I got to ask everybody an honest question. I mean, I can sit here and say, post in the comment section later, what do you think about this? 99.9% .9 of you are not. So you, you answer this in your thoughts. Even if Eric does not return as a Viking Raider and Ivar continues the singles push, does anybody honestly think that this is going to lead to something bigger for Ivar? I enjoy his shit. Maybe he gets a match with Gunther, but what is the future with Ivar? Is he going to suddenly become a single star where he gets a whole bunch of victories and he's a fan favorite or if he's a monster heel? I mean, I, listen, again, I'm enjoying what they're doing with Ivar right now. He's doing excellent. He's winning me over. Because the Viking Raiders, ever since that ship with the Street Profits during the beginning of COVID, I've just totally disowned the Viking Raiders. Ivar is showing that that motherfucker is talented. But I also think to myself, no matter how much we tweet about it, no matter how much people online want to say, give Ivar his flowers. He deserves his flowers. What the fuck does that mean? I know what the phrase means, but what does that mean? His flowers. What does that mean? Icy title? What does that mean? Uh, where? What is the future for Ivar? You know, just saying, he give him his flowers. You get two, 3,000 likes. Oh, I feel good. I mean, okay, Mr. or Mrs. Creative tweeter. What does flowers actually mean when it comes to our viewing pleasure or his actual career? Like, where does this lead? Ivar, I think, needs to be in the tag team because the tag team division seems the shoddiest and it seems his best shot of getting a little bit more success. Beating a New Day member, you know, could only take you so far. You know, what are you going to do? Beat Akira Tozawa? Is he gonna? Is he suddenly gonna squash Johnny Gargano or Tommaso Ciampa? Are we gonna get? Listen, I think we'll probably get Bronson Reed versus Ivar in the very near future. How many times are you gonna do that? So as much as I'm enjoying Ivar right now, and he beat Kofi Kingston today in the Viking Rules match, it was great. I think to myself, okay, how do you take Ivar to the next level? And I don't know if there's even a path. You know, just giving him his flowers, what does that mean? Like, really? I mean, got, it's got to be perception that somebody's going to the next level. Just because someone's on TV doesn't mean that. They, look at Natalia. Look at Natalia. We feared this last week. And sure, if WWE feels like it, hey, Natty, next week you could actually lay out uh, Tegan Knox. As of right now, Natty's got some type of a disorder. And I don't mean that seriously. I mean that creative disorder. Three weeks ago, for some reason, you know, it was that time in the month that she was irate, angry, you know, accusing Tegan Knox of, you know, just this, this, and that. And she's being the ultimate bitch. And then suddenly a week later, oh, I'm rooting for you. You can do it. You can do it. Some people in the Northeast will know I said that. Uh, rest in peace to that guy, by the way. Um, and Tegan Knox puts on a great match with Becky Lynch. WWE's done right, has done right for Tegan Knox the last couple of weeks. The fans care about her. They talk about a little bit of a personal history, her struggles, battles with injuries. You know, you want to root for Tegan Knox. Tegan Lo Knox lost tonight, and for Tegan Knox. You know, in the back, oh, it's the end of the world. I should just quit. I failed. I keep failing. I should quit. And you got a couple of wrestlers. You know, you got Caden Carter, Case, uh, Katana Chance. You know, what are you talking about? Is And then Natty, you did amazing out there. You'll get another shot. Just keep fighting. You're great. You're this, you're that. Even wishing her well, good luck before her match. And I'm like, what happened to Raggy Natty? 
from two weeks ago. It's like a personality disorder. And then later on in the night, here comes Chelsea Green and Piper Nevin, which they come across not as Karens. Chelsea Green does not come off as a Karen. They come off as two of the nastiest cheerleaders in high school or college. You know, if any of you out there, when you went to high school and college, you get some women that are going to school and they're the biggest bitches and they think their shit don't stink. That's what Chelsea Green and Piper Nevin are coming off as right now. Not Karens, but, you know, just like cheerleaders want to make fun of the nerds. They just want to make fun of the losers. Ah, you're a loser. Oh, is this the pity party? I, and that's a good thing. I personally think them being like, I don't want to use the C word, but being like ultimate bitches in school, you know, I think that is better than Karens, personally. Mean girls. Yeah, thank you, Ricky. Mean girls. They're coming across as mean girls. Keep it simple. But Natty is offended by Piper and Chelsea Green taunting Tegan Knox. So next week, Natty's going to take on Piper Nevin. It was so important that WWE did not make a graphic for them, even towards the end of the night. Because next week, we got the Falls Count Anywhere match between Ricochet and Shinsuke Nakamura. Next week... We have Gunther defending the Intercontinental Championship against Bronson Reed. Next week, we got Rhea Ripley defending, I'm assuming defending, the WWE Women's World Championship against Shayna Baszler. And then next week, we were having Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso defending the Undisputed WWE Tag Team Championships against Finn Balor and Damian Priest, the rematch. And if you look at the graphic... It originally said either Cody and Jay or Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn because Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn challenged the silent Cody tonight and Jay Uso. They wanted a match for the tag team championships. Kevin Owens acting a little bit of, of an asshole, saying, like, we're not even going to challenge you because we know Jay's going to say no, basically calling Jay Uso a chicken shit. But Cody Rhodes accepts. And that was your main event tonight. And they gave you about 30 minutes, which was great. It, the, it was a fun match. The outcome was pretty much predictable. I think we were just thankful that the judgment, they didn't get involved, which has been a habit. I don't know what the ratings are going to look like for that match. But, you know, they put on 30 minutes be, with intros, obviously, and outros. But in the end... You know, Kevin Owens ends up getting pinned. You know, they, they have Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso has their version of, uh, like, the, the 1D. And they still got to work at it a little bit more. It's a little off. But interesting point during the main event match tonight, there was a point where Sami Zayn could have cheap-shotted Cody Rhodes, and he didn't. Apparently, this happened during a commercial break, and Kevin Owens was pissed. That Sammy was, you know, being a little bit light. Towards the latter part of the match, Sammy all in trying to win the championships. It didn't feel like a title match. I think people will agree with me. And I felt like a raw main event, not a title match. And there is a big difference if you know what I'm talking about. But in the end, Cody Rhodes, Sammy Zayn, uh, you know, they're still close friends. Sammy Zayn, Jey Uso, very close friends. Sammy always having Jay's back. Kevin Owens holding Jay Uso's arm in the air. Uh, unless there's a swerve in the near future where Kevin Owens just decks him and Sammy Zayn, you know, as they look like, what are you doing, Kevin? I didn't like that ending tonight. Because, like I said, Kevin Owens at the beginning of the night, Jay, I still don't trust you. I don't trust you, Jay. I still don't trust you. And then at the end of the night, you beat me. I trust you. Or I acknowledge you. I'll hold you, I'll hold your hand up high. I don't know. Maybe I'm just nitpicking a little bit. So, um, just uh, two other match results. Becky Lynch, who still has the stitches. You know, she put on a good match with Tegan Knox. I think it was it was nowhere on the level of of the matches she was having with Tiffany Stratton. And I'm not talking about extreme rules. If you saw some of the footage of them on the house show circuit, this was a lot milder. 
Uh, they were playing into the arm injury, but uh, Becky Lynch, great match with Tegan Knox. Listen, I don't see how long this story goes with Tegan Knox. I mean, ultimately, like I said, I think Natty will turn on her. Maybe we'll have Natty and Tegan Knox team up to take on Chelsea Green and Piper Nevin in like two or three weeks. Maybe then Natty ultimately turns on Tegan Knox, and then you got like a lower card storyline feud, but I don't know where this goes from here when you think about some of the other people involved. Zia Lee wants a shot at Becky Lynch's NXT Women's Championship, and I'm all for that. I like Zia Lee. I mean, I don't need to prove that. You know, just when Becky walks off and she says, I will find you, I was like, um, you just found her. <laughs> she, I will find you. You just found her. Um, but obviously, she'll have a match with Zia Lee. You know, don't know if it'll be next week, but uh, we already have two women's matches announced for next week, so I don't think that'll be the case. By the way, Zia Lee, why didn't you just show up at NXT last week and it would have been a fatal five-way to determine a number one contender? So, all right. I think that's pretty much raw tonight. I'm looking at my notes. Everything seems... Oh, I do, do want to bring up... I got a kick out of Otis chopping Chad Gable. Give me another. Thank you. Give me another. Thank you. And then Bronson Reed pissing off Chad Gable. Chad Gable's quest to get another shot at the Intercontinental Championship. Let me tell you something. Even when I just did that twice to my chest, it hurts. So that shit hurts when you chop. I, I used to tell the stories when, when I was working uh, behind the scenes for XPW, there was a couple of nights where we were in a hotel room and all the wrestlers were there and they would have these chop fests. And I remember one, it was Jerry Lynn and I think either Danny Doring or Chaos that still has a training school. Um, I think it's Santino Brothers in California. I think that's the name of the school. But they literally just stood there and just chopped each other until one person gave in. And it was brutal. I mean, you just watch each other. Just You see it on TV when they chop each other. This was like Gunther on steroids in a hotel room. They just legitimately waiting for someone to say, okay, no more. No more. It's pretty wild to see that up close and personal. So, All right. Before we preview AEW and NXT tomorrow, and don't post your ratings yet we'll have a little fun for everybody who's live we'll have everybody post their ratings in the chat room area and we'll look back next week and see who came closest to the ratings will anybody break a million i will tell you what the ratings were a year ago because some people forget that aew and nxt did go head to head on a tuesday a year ago and aew did beat nxt in the ratings it's a little skewed, though, because I don't have those quarter-hour breakdowns, but if you look from a year ago, they had a crazy lead-in from the Big Bang Theory. Like, the, the opening quarter did, like, almost 1.1 million viewers. And then it dropped down to, like, 700,000. So if you take away, or 800,000, if you take away that first quarter and you put it, let's say, at 820, like second quarter was, AEW would have narrowly beat NXT last week, uh, last year. So now one year later, we see how times have changed. But let me quickly give you the ratings for this past week. Uh, for those that are asking, a year ago, Dynamite had 752,000 viewers. NXT had 676. If you balance out hour one without the Big Bang Theory lead-in, AEW have only had about 718,000 viewers. So it would have been very, very close. That was a year ago. So this past week, Raw, 1,511,000 up from the week prior is 1,465. That's not bad, especially when you realize three weeks ago we were like, what, 1.2 million? 
and change. Now we're at 1,511. So they they rebounded pretty nicely over the last couple of weeks. The high point from last week's Raw was Rhea Ripley, J.D. McDonough, Jey Uso, uh, that segment that they had, and the Alpha Academy versus Imperium. That did 1,698,000 viewers. You want some bad news? The match that immediately followed, which was Bronson Reed squashing Cedric Alexander, they lost 200,000 viewers for that match. The minute that match was over, they regained 120,000 of those viewers. Just to give you an idea how many people turned the TV to a different channel, Bronson Reed and Cedric Alexander. The low point of last week's Raw, I know some people will not be happy with this, Gunther versus Tommaso Ciampa, only did 1,340,000 viewers. Will any quarter tomorrow top 1.3 million? Something to think about. NXT last week did 857,000 viewers. That is up from the week prior, 636. The high point last week, Dominic Mysterio regaining the NXT North American Championship. That did 871,000 viewers. I got news for you. Dominic Mysterio and Chuck Williams drew a bigger rating. Not only MJF, but Adam Copeland's Dynamite debut. I'm not saying it to put favor against one person or another, but I'm just pointing that out. MJF did a higher rating than Adam Copeland in his Dynamite debut, but Dominic beat them both. Just telling you. The low point for NXT was a tie. Butch and Tyler Bate versus Gallus and J.C. Jane and Thea Hale versus Lola Vice and Electra Lopez. That 824,000 viewers. The silver lining is that the high quarter and the low quarter were still in the eights. So they really had some pretty even ratings throughout the whole night. Dynamite. This past Wednesday did 800,000 viewers. That is down from the week prior is 855. If you didn't tune in to last week's show, um, I can't, you know, change your mind. But Saturday we talked about how that DVR stuff was just nothing but bullshit. And I explained why. I got into technical reasons why that was bullshit. Did 800,000 viewers. The high point of the night was MJF and Jay White's confrontation, which did 849,000 viewers. And here's a little tidbit that you'll find very interesting. And I mention this now because I want you to remember these two wrestlers in a few moments. That same quarter had Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega taking on Kyle Fletcher and Takeshka. So that quarter did 849. That was the high of the night. But as... Kenny Omega, Chris Jericho versus Takeshka and Kyle Fletcher kept going. The rating went down 35,000 viewers. As that match progressed, they were losing viewers. Remember Kenny Omega and Chris Jericho in a few minutes. The low part of Dynamite, the acclaimed and Billy Gunn versus the Butcher, the Blade, and Kip Sabian. That only did 714,000 viewers. And before anybody says to me, well, DT, maybe it's because it was the Butcher, the Blade, the candlestick maker, the Kip, Kip Sabian. No. Butcher, Blade, Kip Sabian has nothing to do with the claim to Billy Gunn. Everybody they fight, they still are at the lowest ratings of their shows, whether it's Rampage or Collision or Dynamite. I'm just giving you numbers. I like the acclaimed. They're one of my more favorite wrestlers to watch on AEW, but there's make no mistake about it. They are consistently at the bottom of the barrel on AEW ratings. Don't know why. New Japan Pro Wrestling this past week did 44,000 viewers. That is down from the week prior, 62,000. Impact Wrestling this past Thursday did 110,000 viewers. That is down from the week prior, 127,000. Rampage this past Friday, almost identical from the week before. The week prior, they did 364,000 viewers. This week, they did 365,000 viewers. They increased by 1,000. The high point of Rampage, the Hardys, best friends, teaming up to take on Daniel Garcia, Jake Hager, 
Matt Menard and Angelo Parker that did 437,000 viewers. The low point of Rampage was Chris Statlander and Hikaru Shida versus Nyla Rose and Marina Shafir that did 324. SmackDown this past Friday, 2,320,000 viewers. That is slightly up from the week prior is 2,303,000. The high point from this past Friday, a good night once again for L.A. L.A. night. Jimmy Uso, that confrontation at the beginning of the show where uh, L.A. Knight took the receipt out of his pocket when Paul Heyman was complimenting him, that segment did 2,536,000 viewers. The low point of SmackDown, tell it like we always tell it, Rey Mysterio, at least five times in the last two months, he is at the bottom. Rey Mysterio versus Bobby Lashley did 2,181,000 viewers. And I'll add something to that. At the beginning of that match, from the beginning of Rey Mysterio versus Bobby Lashley to the end of the match, they lost 180,000 fans. If you think I'm lying, go do the research. I don't know what it is with Rey Mysterio, but repeatedly we do these breakdowns and Rey is always at the bottom. And there's significant drops. The Street Profits beat the balls out of Cruz del Toro and Joaquin Wilde, and 180,000 fans did not stick around to see it. Pretty wild. And Collision uh, will have this past Saturday's rating tomorrow, so we'll talk about that Wednesday, but the week prior was the lowest rating in Collision's history. 327,000 viewers. That is down from the week before, which was 562. Now, remember I said earlier to remember two wrestlers? The high point from September 30th's collision was Andrade versus Juice Robinson, which did 410,000 viewers. The low point of collision was the acclaimed Billy Guns promo, once again. Alcy Open, Big Bill, uh taking on uh, with Ricky Starks versus FTR, Brian Dennison, and Will Uta, the 266,000 viewers. But here's something else. Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega versus the Gates of Agony did 394,000 viewers, and the rating dropped 70,000 viewers from the beginning of the match to the end of the match. And if anybody is going to blame it on NXT No Mercy... That match was after No Mercy finished. The, well, actually, I should rephrase it like this. The main events for No Mercy, Carmelo Hayes and Ilya Dragunov and Becky Lynch and Tiffany Stratton, those matches, when they went on, Collision was already off the air. So it's not like Collision was up against Becky and Tiffany and Carmelo Hayes and Ilya because those matches went on after Collision was done. Just to give you an idea. So, all right. Uh, this week in wrestling history, this is you'll get a kick out of this. Uh, we have Bret Hart had his first world championship reign. Randy Macho Man Savage went to Memphis on behalf of Vince McMahon, heel Vince McMahon. Uh, you see Coco Beware over there that was fired. Uh, check that out. Brock Lesnar and Shelton Benjamin. In OV, OVW days, DX finally gets their name. They were called. They finally were called Degeneration X this week. Kurt Angle signs with TNA. We had a memorable match at WCW. It was the Warrior and Sting. Remember, they came up in wrestling together. Warrior and Sting took on Hulk Hogan and Bret Hart in WCW. That is a fantasy match. Also, this week in history, we had The Rock hit a rock bottom on a British bulldog in a tray of shit. Think I'm kidding? And listen to this joke. The crowd coming alive as Bulldog flies into those stairs. And the people's champ now, one-on-one -on -one with a bulldog, much like we'll see at No Mercy. Oh, no. No, what's what he doing? doing? That, that, you know, that, 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 that's dog poop. Oh, no kidding. No. Watch things. Rock's got that tray of dog poop in the ring. Now 
Battle Zone. Oh no, Rock Bottom, Rock No! Not in, not into the no! dog poop! Rock Bottom, into the dog poop! Ah! Into the dog poop! The dog poop! The dog poop! A rock bottom into the, the dog poop! Rock Bottom and dog shit. I don't know what they used that night. I wonder if anybody's ever asked The Rock. Like, did they actually use dog shit that night? It, it looked like dog shit. So, yeah, that was a moment this week. Uh, one of the worst moments in TNA history. How many of you have ever been fans of Jersey Shaw? Anybody remember when Jay Wow showed up there? She took on Cookie, the former Becky Bayless on the indie circuit here in the Northeast. Jay Wow, I never liked Jersey Shaw. She was so uninterested in being in in TNA. Listen to this promo exchange between Becky Bayless, who was Cookie, in TNA, and just listen to Jay Wow. I don't know if maybe she was just on some medicinal um, supplements that night, but uh, tell me if you would be interested in wanting to see this match. Earlier tonight, Jersey Shore bombshell Wow was on the hunt for Cookie. Cookie. When these She's two eventually came face to face in the middle of the TNA wrestling ring, all hell broke loose. Those Jersey Shore posers, they're done for. No. No disrespect, but this sounds like something that would have been in AEW right now. I'm not kidding either. Tell me this wouldn't sound like it would be in AEW. More of that disgrace, Nookie. And no more of that skank J cow. Yeah, Rob and Cookie are um, imitating us. So uh, it's quite funny, but um, you know, it is what it is, and we'll have to go in the ring. Did you say something? Oh! Look who decided to show up! It's that Jersey Shore poser, J cow! the last we'll see of Wow and TNA wrestling. You know, I never thought I could be able to do it. It's uh, it's pretty intense, but after getting in the ring and, you know, going in there, the adrenaline rush, I could definitely see myself, you know, doing something like this in the future. Yeah, the TNA bug got to me. Uh, yeah, I have a little TNA yeah. fever. Fucking Nile, the West Nile should have got to her. I don't mean that literally, but the TNA... The TNA bug got to me. Yeah, I could see myself doing this. Yeah, fuck yourself. Fuck you, TNA, for doing that shit. All right, this week in history. Infamous promo, Cactus Jack and Raven in ECW. Diamond Dallas Page with his veneers. Trolling Kurt Angle. Judy Bagwell pissing off Scott Steiner. Look at Dustin Rhodes as seven. Coming to WCW. Mickey James had a first ever WWE match this week. Drew, Drew McIntyre, even though he's not on there, had his first ever match this week in WWE. Yep, 10 10 10. They're here. They're here. Uh, Steve Austin fills up Vince McMahon's Corvette with concrete. Oh, I got a treat for all of you in a second. I forgot to have this. I got two treats for you. Shawn Michaels gets jumped in a bar. What's that all about? He gets knocked out, but. Two other cool moments. I know I mentioned this yesterday. Uh, nine years ago this week, the Wyatts popped up on WWE TV. Hey, you want to say something really scary? <laughs> <laughs> we live in a world where society has poisoned the souls of men. It hovers over them like a dark cloud, and they can't do anything about it. Because it's just a regular, everyday working class. 
people like me, like me, like me. They get down on their hands and knees and they whisper these little lies and secrets into their ears. But I have a secret of my own. They didn't debut yet. They were coming. Yeah. What are you going to do when they decide it's time? We are the ones. When they start to walk upright. The ones you've been told about. And we are walking upright. What are you going to do? Well, I know what you're going to do. Run. You're going to tell them we're coming. Run. Now send us someone. Just don't send anyone you want back. Witness the new face of fear. And everywhere that Mary went. Sure to go. <laughs> we're coming. That was epic, man. I know we were popping big. We were popping big because we were following what was going on in NXT. Even Florida Championship Wrestling when it was developing, man. Rest in peace, Bray Wyatt, man. Rest in peace. But we're not going to finish this week in wrestling history on a real downer. This week in history, the infamous rap battle between Kurt Angle and John Cena. This week in history. This has got to be, what, 20 years about? It's got to be 20 years. It's the 20th anniversary. I'm not going to play the whole thing because it's too long. But if any of you out there that never watched this or maybe haven't heard it in 20 years, this is just a sample of what happened with Kurt Angle and John Cena. All right, here's the deal. In 10 days, Kurt Angle will be facing John Cena in this very ring in a wrestling match. But tonight, right here on SmackDown, Kurt Angle has challenged John Cena to a different competition. A competition, in my opinion, that John Cena is probably going to do pretty good in. And it's called a battle rap. So without any further ado, let's bring out the doctor of thugonomics. Now, I, I'm not going to play John the whole theme because we obviously uh, have some time constraints. So I'll fast forward this a little bit. But just to give you a little taste of what went down. Everybody here in Hartford right here tonight is going gonna, is gonna to decide which one of you guys sucked or which one of you guys should win. So, Kurt, being that you challenged... Hang on. I didn't go anywhere. I'm just adjusting something here. I think John Cena, you should lay down your deal first. So, go for you it. You want me to go first? You, yeah, you go first. All right. You want a battle? I refuse to get ripped. You little b You couldn't wrap a Christmas gift. You're not all American, Kurt. You wore out the gimmick. You couldn't win a bronze medal in the Special Olympics. I'm the dirty America. Look in my eyes, I'm right here. You're the American dream. I'm America's nightmare. I'm just a punk. F***ing off more people than prank calls. Hope you got your three eyes, Kurt. Cause you got no b yeah, they censored it back then. And when God was handing out brains, it's obvious you didn't get none. I'm usually throwing up two fingers, but you're special. You only get one. So hit this cat's music so the fans can say you suck too. His finger doesn't mean you're number one, Kurt. It means I'm saying... This is good. Except this should get a kick out line, of it. That was pretty good. I mean, Cena, I can't compete with that. You're a tremendous rapper. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Instead of rapping tonight, I'm going to tell you a little story. And it goes something like this. There once was a kid who liked to talk a lot of smack. 
He's actually whiter than me, but he thinks he's black. And the kid thinks that he's the king of talking trash. Until one day he bumped heads with the king of kicking ass. <laughs> he had a secret weapon. He liked to use a steel chain. I'll shove it straight up your ass if you try to use it again. He tried. He tried. He can't run. He can't hide. It doesn't even matter if he's rapping. Because of no mercy, when I get my hands on him, his ass will be tapping. And let me tell you the real reason why I'm out here tonight. I didn't come out here to rap. I came here to fight. There's a lot more to it, but you'll have to tune into that. So, by the way, you know, I got to tell you something else. We're not going to get into the list today, but a few people brought it to my attention. WWE just put out their top 10 list of the greatest moments in SmackDown history. And I don't even want to tell you what's on that list yet. We'll talk about it on Saturday. But I will tell you this. When I saw the top 10, let me just put it this way. The supermarket moment, that brawl that Steve Austin had with Booker T, you know, um, yeah. D didn't even make the top 10. Let's just put it that way. It, 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 not, it didn't even make the top 10. That should tell you all you need to know as far as how good that list is. Price check on a jackass. That's what I was trying to remember. I was thinking about the moment in my head. So, all right, let's bring this home. Um, once again, tomorrow night, you're welcome to join me for the watch party. You know, we normally do NXT, and we plan on doing NXT, but I will be putting AEW on the screen as well. We'll do some picture in picture so at least we can watch what goes down with AEW tomorrow night. I will tell you this, and I'm just giving you my honest take on things. Now, we already know pretty much what WWE has announced so far. Even though they have not announced The Undertaker, they've been teasing the gong, The Undertaker will be there. What he actually will do, I have no idea. You know, some people think he'll interact with Joe Gacy. Some people think that he'll just come out there and cut a promo. Whatever it is, Undertaker will be appearing. The match that everybody is talking about is Carmelo Hayes taking on Braun Breaker. No championships on the line. John Cena will be in the corner of Carmelo Hayes. Paul Heyman will be in the corner of Braun Breaker. It's interesting how quick... Paul Heyman's hair has gone gray because he doesn't dye it anymore. Yeah, I know a lot of people have noticed that. Yeah, Paul Heyman, as of two weeks ago, stopped dyeing his hair. It is now full-blown gray. It's always been gray, but he's been adding a little hair dye up until very recently. So that is one match that is going down. Another match that is going down is Asuka taking on Roxanne Perez. Now remember, the storyline is, if I remember correctly, Kiana James... Uh, bringing Asuka to NXT. So I expect Asuka to win, but I also expect Asuka to probably lay out Kiana James or someone else. So Asuka is going to take on Roxanne Perez. And look, that's a nice rub for Roxanne Perez to see if she can hang with one of the top you know, women in WWE. Asuka's what, top two? Top three in people's eyes? I mean, if you could put on a half decent match with Oscar, you know, you show, you know, where you are as far as on the level. You know, I know a lot of people think, oh, they're just stacking it up to beat AEW in the ratings. Listen, 
That is a treat for all of us fans that watch NXT every week. That is a treat for all the fans who go every week in Florida to NXT. But most importantly, that is a treat for every NXT wrestler who watches Raw, who watches SmackDown, and always fantasizes and envisions them one day breaking that roster as well. And not only are they getting wrestlers that are on the roster, they're getting legends, they're getting people from yesteryear, from today. This is tremendous all around. People online saying, oh, WWE's just doing that to be AEW, that they have thin skin and they, you know, they just get, shut up, enjoy it. We're getting a special night of wrestling on both sides. And I'm not trying to be this uber positive person. It's just, this is good shit. This is for us to enjoy. You know, for whatever reason. I think, honestly, and I'll just say it, I think the people complaining are the ones who are afraid that their favorite product is going to lose in the ratings. In fact, they may get an ass kicking in the ratings. And I think to try to cover up that insecurity that, you know, hey, for one night we got some special shit that we weren't expecting. We're getting 30 minutes free, commercial free on both shows. We're getting a 10-minute overrun for AEW. We're getting some good quality matches. One of the matches I absolutely can't wait to see is Swerve Strickland defeat Brian Danielson. I want to see that fucking match. You know, we're getting good stuff, but people have to complain. You know, just, it's not, you're not losing. You're gaining. You're getting a special night. Even if NXT wipes AEW in the ratings, you didn't lose nothing. AEW didn't lose nothing either. We're getting good shit tomorrow night. Why fans think, oh, you know, WWE, they couldn't hit... No, just enjoy it. Just, I don't get that. You know, they're afraid of their product getting a dismal low rating. What, are you going to get that triggered if people laugh at you? The, the, the people laughing at these people are ridiculous as well. Just enjoy it. It's a good night. We're getting good shit to enjoy. And Cody Rhodes will be making a very big announcement. We'll see if he gets interrupted. Also, we have a six-man tag match of Gallus taking on Tyler Bate, Butch, and Rich Holland will be making an appearance. And we have, I believe, the women's breakout tournament will continue. I don't believe they announced the match yet. And there's going to be a couple of more surprises. I will tell you this right now. Please do not report this as news. But someone told me that they were working on getting LA Knight there as well that there's going to be some other names showing up unannounced. You will see some surprises on NXT that have not been announced. And I'm not just talking about Undertaker. You will see some additional names. There's rumors that Triple H will be there with Shawn Michaels. There's rumors that we may even see a little bit of, uh, not end up, not DX, but there's more names that they plan on bringing out there. So, fun night. On the AEW side... I will tell you, and I'm not nitpicking here, but I'm kind of blown away, surprised, shocked that MJF is not defending his championship. The guy is the number one guy in the ratings for this show. Every week we point out he beats everybody on Dynamite. And instead, we're going to hear from MJF. They should have announced him defending his championship. They could have easily, and again, Brian Danielson versus Swerve Strickland is the match I'm looking forward to seeing. It just sucks that it's a number one contenders match for the TNT championship. I mean, I get it. Ray Phoenix is the TNT champion. But it's like, for one night only, you know, number one contenders match or winner faces... MJF in the main event. One night only. Swerve Strickler versus Brian Danielson. The winner faces MJF later in the night for the World Heavyweight Championship. We know who's going to win. I would have just done that. And I honestly think AEW would have had a legitimate shot in beating 
uh, WWE, NXT, and the ratings. But they did not do that. MJF will talk. They're doing a segment with Tony Storm. And Tony Storm is killing it in her character right now. It's amazing how many AEW fans that still don't understand where the inspiration from that character came from and her appearing in that wrestler movie. You know, she replaced, I don't know if she replaced Liv Morgan or somebody else, but, you know, because it's a retro movie, you know, the, that's where the makeup and the look and everything like that, and she carried it over in AEW, and she's doing a great job. But they're making it come across as if she's like this big cornerstone with ratings, and they got to be careful with that tomorrow night because I don't know if it's, you know, like just because she's got an amazing look and an amazing character right now and she's putting a ton of effort into it, we also realize that Tony Khan does not put a lot of effort in that women's division. Four years later, you'd be lucky if you get two women's matches on a Dynamite. In fact, I, I probably could count on one hand how many times that's happened. So you could have the picture-perfect character, but if the perception is, why do you think the women's matches always are on the low end of the ratings? Because people know where they are on the food chain in AEW. So here's your matches announced for AEW. We have Powerhouse Hobbs versus Chris Jericho. All right. I don't mind seeing that. I am a huge fan of Powerhouse Hobbs, but as I've said at least three times in the last two years, and each time we've said it, we've been proven right, let's see what Hobbs is doing a month from now on TV. Or even if he beats Jericho, you know, it's, does anybody feel like suddenly AEW had an epiphany? Like, fuck, we got a, 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 a gold mine. We got gold here with Powerhouse Hobbs. Let's fucking push this guy to the moon. No, it doesn't feel that way doesn't feel that way we have as i said swerve strickland taking on brian danielson and the winner will end up getting a shot for the tnt championship jay white will be taken on hangman page ray phoenix will have a rematch against john moxley for the aew international championship and we got soraya defending the women's championship against Hikaru Shida. So that'll be an interesting rematch. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the deal is with this guy Kyle in the chat, but yeah, you, you know, but you could you could block him, you know. When you you know, I don't mind a little troll, as long as um, you know you you have a little fun and don't spam. But you know, when you write some of the shit you write, you know, you, you're not doing anything here. You you might get. 10 seconds of ha-ha, and then you're gone. So, And then you got Adam Copeland taking on Luchasaurus. And like I said on Wednesday, we're going to have an honest conversation about Adam Copeland. Adam Copeland is not the answer of CM Punk leaving. We absolutely are big fans of Adam Copeland. We like Adam Copeland. How could you not admire the guy, like the guy. The guy loves pro wrestling. After all these years, he wants to still do it, and he wants to do it at a high level. How do you not appreciate that? But they don't even have 2,500 tickets sold for tomorrow. This past Saturday's collision, somebody sent me a video. I can't verify what time the video was shot, but it was very, very close to the beginning of collision and the building is 80% empty. And that's with Adam Copeland announced. It reminds me, and I watched clips of the Monday Night War the other day. It reminds me of that miniseries that it, WWE did years ago, the Monday Night War. I think it's episode 19. I haven't watched it full yet, but I'm gonna get the clip. I remember Chris Jericho talking about the demise of WCW. I'm not saying there's a demise of AEW. Please, not even saying that. But something that he did say that always stuck with me, that once the fans leave or they're not interested, you could have Bruno San Martino, you could have Hulk Hogan, you could have the best of the best, the legendary, the biggest names, but 
it doesn't matter. And it's true. You could throw you Mercedes Monet. You could throw Adam Copeland. You know, there are a few names that I think would definitely get some buzz. Like I said, if Randy Orton were to show up there, it'd be pretty intriguing. I know I would tune in just to see what goes down. You know, but at the end of the day, Adam Copeland, the vibe I get is the same vibe I got when Jeff Hardy went to AEW. Reformed the Hardys, a little bit of nostalgia, and after a couple of weeks, oh, you know, the Hardys, okay, you know, all right, good. You know, I'm they, they, they look good. They still could go a little bit. But on the food chain, we know where they are on there. You could feel it. You see what happened with FTR on Saturday's collision. They did a title change because Cash Wheeler is injured. And at the same time, that mindset is, let's take the titles off of FTR because Cash Wheeler is injured. But let's keep the Ring of Honor Tag Team Championships on Adam Cole. I mean, on MJF and Adam Cole, even though Adam Cole is going to be out for months and months and months and months, maybe six months. I don't know. I mean, I don't care if it's a storyline. If it was a storyline, he should have dropped those titles to Aussie Open, whoever it is, you know, Gates of Ag, whatever you want to use, Vincent and Zeus, whatever you want to fucking use, I, any team. The fact that MJF still has the Ring of Honor Tag Team Championships and FTR doesn't just shows you kind of like this creative fear that if we show any weakness for MJF whatsoever, that fans are going to turn it off, that everything is got No. And I just am shocked. I'm shocked that MJF is not defending his championship on tomorrow night. You're doing a 30-minute, no commercials, a 10-minute overrun, and the guy who people want to see more than anybody else is not wrestling. Maybe we get a surprise. Maybe one of AEW's surprises is that MJF does wrestle tomorrow night. But, you know, look, look at the matches we have right here. You got six matches announced. AEW normally does five on a Dynamite. You did six now because it's a 10-minute overrun, so you have room for a sixth. Are they actually going to do a seventh? If they do a seventh, you know what that means? One or two of these matches only go in two, three minutes. And trust me, I don't think anybody out there wants to see Adam Cole and Luchasaurus go two minutes or Powerhouse Hobbs and Chris Jericho go two minutes. So they're doing MJF and Jay White at full gear, and that's fine and everything, but you go this far for Tuesday night, you got to go a little bit farther, in my honest opinion. And there's no excuse for MJF to not be defending that championship on Tuesday. Plus, can I just say one last thing before we wrap it up? Look at the name of Dynamite. It is Title Tuesday. Is Hangman Adam Page defending his championship? I don't believe so. Is Swerve Strickland and Brian Danielson fighting? Does any of them have a championship right now that they're defending? No. Is Adam Copeland and Luchasaurus defending a championship? No. Is Powerhouse Hobbs and Chris Jericho defending a championship? No. This is Title Tuesday. Title Tuesday. Saray and Akarashita is the only one defending a title. Why is it called Title Tuesday? So, if they do surprises and we get title matches, that's fine. But as of right now, oh, actually, I'm sorry, Ray Phoenix and John Moxley are fighting for a title too. But it's Title Tuesday, and as of right now, only one third of the matches are titles. I don't get that. Hey, we're going to get some surprises tomorrow on both sides. Let's see what goes down. One thing is for certain, we are going to have an absolutely fun night tomorrow night. Again, you're welcome to join me for the watch party. It is free. And I will be on the floor moderating. And I'm going to be testing out the equipment early tomorrow. So if you get an alert that there's a live stream going on and it's during the day, 
Uh, that's just me testing shit out because I got to share screens and do picture and picture. Doing two shows at the same time is not going to be easy. But, you know, I'm up for the challenge, and I think it'll be a lot of fun. It'll be a fun night to remember. And then immediately after Dynamite and NXT tomorrow, I'll be on Patreon doing a weekly Patreon show. So I'm sure we will talk about it a little bit. But Wednesday, I will return for Wednesday Night Dynamite. We will definitely talk about what went down on Tuesday. We will have the ratings by Wednesday night. Now, right before we go off the air, everybody who is live in the chat room, you are welcome to post what you think the NXT rating will be and what you think the AEW rating will be. I have not thought about this long and hard, but I will tell you that I believe the NXT rating will be in the nines. Do I think NXT breaks a million viewers? Maybe for a quarter here and there, but I think NXT does 989. That might even be a little high. It might be more like 940, 950, but I'm going to go with 989 because I think The Undertaker will draw a nice number. You know, Cena, I think because he's on every week, I don't think Cena is going to be as big of a, and I know that sounds crazy to say, but we're going to get some surprises too. And Oscar will be a nice, fun match, but that's not going to be a ratings kill. In fact, more I think about it, you know, the Judgment Day may appear. I heard the Judgment Day may be there. I'm actually going to lower my number a little bit. I'm going to go with 944 because I saw a really nice Porsche today. I'm going to go with 944. But if it does do 989, I get little, you know, secondary credit. But 944, I think, will be a, a decent number. Now, remember, AEW, uh, NXT's done high eights without AEW on. So I know what some people are going to say. Wow, they couldn't even break a million viewers and they had all these people on there. Um, I think it does the nines. I And I think with AEW on, put it this way. For Tuesday night, we're going to have probably a million six watching wrestling. That's not bad. That's higher than Raw. Add NXT and AEW together, 1.6, 1.5 million fans. That is more than Raw. So I'm going to go with 989. Actually, no, I'm going to go with 944 for, for NXT. And for AEW, you know, some people are going to be surprised when they say this. I'm going to go with 677. I'm going to go with 677. I do not think AEW is going to blow it out of the water. Um, they get, they will get a 30-minute thir uh, commercial free. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with 677. And 944. Those are the numbers. So uh, so before we go off the air, like I said, you're welcome to post a rating in the chat. And we'll look back next week and we'll see uh, who actually nailed it. But again, those numbers may seem low to some of you out there. Some of you think 677 is an awfully low, low number for AEW. I think a lot of WWE fans watch AEW. And I think when they have to pick and choose, I think they're going to lean towards NXT over AEW. So, all right. I'm going to jet out of here. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. I hope you can join me tomorrow on a watch party for a little bit of fun. And uh, if you're a part of our Patreon family, patreon.com slash Don Tony, you can check me out live tomorrow night after both shows go off the air. And uh, if not, with any of that, Wednesday. We will do a Wednesday Night Dynamite. We'll recap. We'll get into the ratings. We'll talk some honest discussion about Adam Copeland and his drawing ability in 2023. And is there anybody that could, you know, cause an influx in ratings for AEW? Is there anybody out there? So, my friends, have a good one. I apologize if I sound a little bit congested today. I am battling a little bit of a cold. And I'm trying to get that out of my system. So I uh, hope to see you all again in the next couple of days. Be well. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a podcaster. For me to live any other way was nuts. To me, those goody good people who work shitty jobs for bum paychecks and took the subway to work every day and worried about their bills were dead. I mean, they were suckers. They had no balls. If I wanted something, I just tuck it. 
I ran everything. I paid the bills. I paid the hosts. I even paid the masked maniac. Everybody had their hands out. Everything was for the taking. We always called each other good fellas. You would always hear from somebody. You're gonna like Don Tony. He's all right. He's a good fella. He's one of us. But if you're part of my crew, nobody ever tells you they're gonna get rid of you. It doesn't happen that way. There weren't any arguments or curses like in the movies. See, your haters come with smiles. They come as your friends, the people who've claimed they care the most for your life. And now, now that's all over. And that's the best part. Today everything is different. There's lots of action. I don't have to wait around for everything like everyone else. Oh, I didn't get the vaccine? Fuck you, vaccine me. Oh, your delivery guy has COVID? Fuck you, feed me. Right after I moved here, I ordered egg noodles and ketchup, and I got spaghetti with meat sauce. I'm no longer an average nobody, while they get to live the rest of their lives like a bunch of schnooks.